Um, I don't know the reason, I guess, because there's got to be a fix with the bandwidth or something, but I was asked if everybody could just turn off their Wi-Fi on their phones if you don't want to turn the phone off. And uh, somehow it's affecting, and we're, we're dealing with ECT. Do a guy say any more? Or ETC, whatever they're called. And uh, so if you'll, we'll do that. That way we won't have any buffeting when we're um, live streaming is what we do every every Sunday, every Wednesday. So, any questions, comments? Too bad if you got any questions. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Also join, join us for discipleship training every Sunday morning. Um, Pastor Leah, Leah's teaching on I am who you say I am, and that's uh, um, really what we have to understand as believers, who we are in Christ. Until we really understand that, and even then, it's an ongoing, never-ending, ever-expanding knowledge of who we are in Christ, because it's based on who He is. Amen? And what that you'll never exhaust that. Wednesday night Bible study is the Joy Bells uh, for girls at 7 p.m. Uh, be here for that. And preppers will not be meeting this week. Okay, so you're taking two week hiatus or whatever. Okay. All right, it'll start back up on the 27th of August. Uh, a reminder to check us out and subscribe to Facebook where Leah posts a devotional, daily devotional. And please like us and please share it. I uh, talked with a um, woman last night from Western Montana, extreme Western Montana, and uh, she wanted our website. She wants to start watching. She's in a town of 120 people, and there's just there's some churches there, but they they just don't they just aren't preaching the word of God. And the nearest home church she could go to is six hour drive away. So, um, you know, if you've ever been out west, that's not unheard of um, to find a place to worship. But I want to say something too. I don't know if anybody has seen the videos, but they were burning Bibles in Seattle on Saturday night, Saturday night or Friday night. Can I tell you something? That sounds a lot like the ones they say they're anti fascist. No, that's what the fascists do. They're not anti-fascist. They are fascists themselves. They're anti-capitalist, um, which uh, true fascism still worked with capitalism, um, but it was all government controlled. And really that's what uh, the modern uh, Chinese Communist Party is really more fascist, more like the Nazi Party than true communism. Because you know what they found out? Communism doesn't work. All I had to do was look their neighbor to the uh, West, which was the Soviet Union collapse because Without the incentive to reap what you uh, sow and to reap of your hard labor, guess what? Pretty soon you get tired of carrying four buckets of water when you only get a half a bucket. And what, that when, and what transpires then is GNP goes down, becomes stagnant, because people are not going to work harder than somebody else who's getting the same thing. Just, just not going to do it. But I thank God we live in this country, but we better be praying and standing up for our rights because if the Democrats get in and, want, and get their agenda and they were to gain both houses and the presidency, um, and I'm not saying this is a scare tactic, but it's the truth and it's reality. If you've studied communism, we will forever be changed. This country will go down quickly. And you will start seeing uh, private properties conf confiscated through a, uh, excessively high taxes, which is a form of, pro, uh, of uh, you know, confiscation. But if you don't think that can happen, just look at history. Venezuela uh, and South America, perfect example. They were the wealthiest nation in South America until the communists took over. And it was uh, in 2018, the average weight loss of the Venezuelan, Venezuelan citizen was 18 pounds. And they were not on diets by, ch by a choice. Do you understand how big that is? The average weight loss was almost 19 pounds. That's the average. 
That means you had a lot more people losing a lot more than that simply because they are starving. That's communism, people out there that you are millennials. And um, you just look at the, the uh, this is not about Black Lives Matter. And I want to say something on that. All lives matter to Jesus Christ. And if all lives don't matter, then I'm going to tell you something. No lives matter. It's not a pick and choose. We pick this race over that race. And I'm going to tell you something. Racism is just as bad if it comes from black to white or white to black. It's still a stench in the nostrils of God. God abhors it, hates it. And anybody out there that's listening to me, because all of you, I don't have to say this, but if you say you love God or that you love humanity or you love a stone or you love a, a political party yet you hate your brother, there's no truth in you. In fact, the scripture says, if you say you love me but hate your brother, and by the word that word, by the way, that word brother means your fellow man. God says this, not the pastor. I'm just repeating what God says. The love of God is not in you. You're a liar. So that being said, <laughs> how do you transition from that, right? Let's go into worship. Because we worship a God of truth and of love. And you want to know what love is? Look at the cross. That's the extreme example of love. Oh, men's and ladies tomorrow night at Buffalo's? Joe said he's buying because he missed it last time. Joe, you didn't say that? <laughs> yeah, it's 6.30. Come one and all, we'll have a good time. And uh, just to be, we were thinking of something crazy we could talk about. And we don't talk about bad things. And always end up talking about the Lord. But we were going to see who can come up with the craziest conspiracy theory. And that, that's our... <laughs> yeah, yeah, Shannon said we'll be there all night. Now, we'll see you tomorrow night. And ladies, you're meeting also, right? Yes. At our house. And I've, well, they do that because they don't want any men around. See, they're, they're, being, uh, they're being coy with that, right? <laughs> all right, let's praise the Lord.
praise this morning. We bless your name. We worship you this morning. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go, let's vocalize our praise this morning. Can we love on him this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
there's just something educators who uh, were meeting for a conference and the general theme we didn't know each other the general theme became around the table how everyone no matter where they came from or what age or, or socioeconomic wherever you know they came from the general theme had been that they had been either raised in church you know or a church musician or something like that you know and they were age ranges from about 20 to uh, all the way up to 70s uh, and yet there was a pretty theme as the evening went on and we ate that we've been talking about our experiences that they began to talk about how they were all somewhat raised in church or went to Sunday school but that currently they were not going um, somewhere they were not participating in a church or anything like that and um, I sat and listened and uh, I was involved in a church and was a music minister and also was a music educator and um, it I, I got more irritated as the evening went on because as they would share their stories of why they weren't no playing for church or no longer in church, it came down to this one word that kept coming up, and it was they. Uh, they kept saying, "Well, you know, they said that that I um, this, and they said that I wasn't welcome there." they said that if I went there that I had to do, you know, this or that, and, and so, and, uh, and then they talked about me, or they, they did this, and it was this reoccurring theme of, of hurt, you know, and, and, and pain um, from a place that I, um, I love, you know, church. I grew up in church. I was raised on the front pew, underneath the pew in church when people ran around the church. I, I've seen it all. Uh, I'm, I'm a, what you call a church boy. Um, but I walked away from the Lord in my life right in the middle of church, right in the middle of leading worship. I didn't plan on saying this. You just asked me to share something, and I turned it over to the Lord. So here we go. Um, I walked away from the Lord leading worship. Your body can be one place and you can walk right out. Am I telling the truth in this place? Uh, some of y'all have done that on your marriage. Uh, so anyway, and on a few other things. So you know what I'm talking about. You can walk out on the Lord. And I walked right out on him and, and followed what I wanted to do because I thought, well, I deserved it. It's my time or it's this or this makes me feel good. And, and so, um, but I can't, though he got, he came and got me. He, you can't go. You can, you can run, but you can't hide. And he ain't scared. There's nothing on this earth that scares him. And he will come find you. And he came and found me right on time. 
because I was, I am good at making hot messes of a lot of things, and uh, if I can't fix it, I'll break it, and, and I had, it happened, and so I, it was a mess, and the Lord came and found me, and so if he came and found me and loved on me and brought me right back into his house of safety and his house of love, and that's not a building, I'm talking about the people, into a place of safety and of love to where the Lord can work on me and fix me and fix what's right and finish the work and sanctify me. Um, and so if he can do that for me, he'll do that for anyone else. And so here I am listening to all these people share these stories of heard how all these church people had talked about him and said this and got mean and told him this and told him that and came down to misrepresented him. And, and I sat there all evening long and I was stewing at, and I was just stewing uh, and, the, and I couldn't say anything. He, he was like, no, don't you say a word. Just shut up and, and, and listen. So all night long. So that night I couldn't sleep and I, I, t I talked to the Lord and I said, I, what, what do I do? What, what should I do? Because because this is not right. That's not who you are. That's not my father. I can, uh, earthly fathers are going to disappoint you, but not my father in heaven. And so I said, what do I do? And I prayed and I, and I asked the Lord and there was just, just nothing. And I was miserable all night long. And the next morning uh, I woke up and he said, um, what would you say if I gave you the opportunity to speak to those people that were disenfranchised, that were thrown out, that were given up on because you're too much work? for us to do am I talking to anybody that's been said to me so I'm just gonna tell I'm testifying I'm not speaking make-believe um, there are people listening and watching right now I guarantee you that can identify with this as well uh, and he said what would you tell them what would you say about me because people folk are not telling the truth they're not telling the whole truth right. let me just let me say the whole truth they're, they're right. stopping on one or two things and we do that so what would you do? What would you say? If I gave you that opportunity, what would you say to them? What would you tell them about me? And that was all he said. And um, this is what I would say. Your sin is greater than your sin, and His 
Thank you, Jesus. Have you experienced that grace that's greater than your sin? Have you experienced the love of God that reaches down no matter where you are and has the strength to pull you up and set you in the lap of the Father? Amen? It's peace that truly does pass all understanding. You can't explain it. We don't deserve it. But that's the love of God manifested through Jesus Christ in the heart and life of those that will put their faith and trust in Him. He is truly one that sticks closer than a brother. Every human being will fail you from time to time. But there's one that never fails. When you walk through the darkest of valleys, He's there right alongside you. And when you can't take another step, guess what? He'll pick you up and carry you. Amen. We got some here that are going through a valley right now. They didn't ask for it, didn't want it, didn't expect it. But I'm here to tell you, you hang on to God and see what He does. Amen. And I tell you, the world and those, there's many people that have left the church and are leaving the church today. Part of that and much of that's probably due to the fact that this pulpit hasn't preached the Word of God because unless you preach the Word of God, there's no delivering power. There's no delivering power in man's wisdom. There's no delivering power in psychology methods and, and uh, a dose of feel good. There's no delivering power in that. The only delivering power comes from what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. And when He said, it is finished, that power was more than enough. Listen to me, more than enough, it broke Satan and every scheme he has against humanity, against the child of God, Jesus on that cross when he said it is finished, crushed the head of the devil and all those that are under his control. You are more than a conqueror. Jesus said you're more than a conqueror. Paul, I believe, said that. You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So don't give up. You keep on keeping on. That's what the old timers used to say. And it was true, didn't it? 
I'm not talking about old religious that were self-righteous. I'm talking about people who struggled in the midnight hour. But when the morning came, they had victory with Christ. Amen. They had His victory. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. Let's sing that chorus just one last time. His love. Because His love. Yes. It's deeper than the ocean. Father, I thank you and I praise you and I worship you, God, and magnify your precious name, O oh God. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I praise you and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your strength in my body. I rebuke any sickness the devil's trying to put on me. You're not going to do it. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been bought and purchased by such a great price. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. Can I have our ushers come up here, please? Shannon, just continue to play that while the ushers come up. That's a beautiful song, and it's written by our very own. If you can't see the name down in the left-hand corner, it's Shannon Tebow. So, we've been blessed with Shannon, and I'm thankful for that. Amen. Shannon, you've done a lot of great work. I don't say that to puff you up, but you are uh, made a difference in this congregation and in our lives personally. Yeah, in his spirit. And I said in our lives personally. Yeah. Yeah. And he will not turn down pan fried country fried steak. <laughs> Amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give and ask that you bless it, and we know you will. And Father, just move upon all our hearts to receive the greater blessing, and that's your word here today. And we just thank you and we praise you in Christ's lovely name. Amen. Children, you're dismissed with your children's pastors. And thank you, Alan, because he's always got water up here for me. There he is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Stand with me for the reading of God's Word. And before we do that, pick up your Bibles. And many of you have them in your phone. Well, that's okay. It's still the Word of God. Amen. Say it with me. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It never changes so that it will change me. Boy, that makes a difference, doesn't it? And we're continuing, this is part seven in our series as we go through, and we got about three weeks left and then the Lord will move me on to something else. But it was key, and it is key to the victory of living a Christ-centered life in this world by understanding, and you need to understand Romans chapter six, seven, and eight. Chapter six, tells you how you live and walk in this daily world and, our, and, and it solidifies and makes clear what our identity is and more particular, who we identify with and that is our identity is in Christ. That's the whole uh, title of these messages with the subtitles is in Christ. Chapter seven talks about Paul, even after he was saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the struggles he had because he had not learned what he wrote down in chapter six but glory to God, the Holy Spirit revealed that to him, and he's revealed it to the church ever since. But Paul was talking about trying to serve God in his own strength in chapter 7, to where he finally cried out, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? But the last verse of that chapter, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He understood then that, and just what most Christians need to understand, because they do not understand who they are in Christ, and what that entails, and how to gain victory victory over the flesh in all areas of your life. That brings us to chapter 8, which we're in, and that is bringing uh, the reality of the Holy Spirit living in the life of the believer, and how when we yield to Him, instead of the old nature, how He works in the life of the believer and brings to pass 
everything that God wants to do in our lives. The only thing that hinders the work of God in your life and mine is that beautiful person that looks back at you in the mirror. Amen? Let's read now. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now I want to remind you of something here. Paul is not, when he's referring to the carnally minded, he's not talking about the sinner specifically. In fact, the whole juxta of the matter and the whole thrust of chapter 8 is Paul is talking to the believer. So believers can be carnally minded. And if you're carnally minded, it leads to what? Death. But to be spiritually minded, led of the Holy Spirit, is life and peace. Verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, a lot of people, when they see that, would immediately think, well, that's just having sinful thoughts and doing that. No, carnally minded here is referring to anyone, even a believer, who tries to serve God in their own self-effort or through religious ceremony or law. God calls that carnally minded because He will not accept your effort. And what I mean by that, you're doing something for God, so God, you got to give me that which I need. That's called works, and God doesn't operate grace on the basis of works. Grace by its very definition means God is extending love to you even though you do not deserve it. Amen? For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh. Now, would he talk about not being in the flesh to the unbeliever? Because that's all the unbeliever is. He's ruled by the sin nature. So who is he talking here to? He's talking to the believer. He's reminded them and the Holy Spirit through Paul's reminding us that we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Simply meaning if you're not born again, the Holy Spirit upon being saved and born again comes to live in your heart and life. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're not of God. You're not his. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, he's making a rhetorical statement here. The body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him, who's Him? God, but the Spirit of God that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. Now here's interesting. Notice, your mortal bodies. Not the new body you're going to get at the moment of the resurrection and the rapture, which happened at the exact moment, but this body by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, again, we are debtors, not to the flesh, not to the sin nature, not to be led by our, our evil passions, but to live after the flesh, or to live after the flesh, sorry. Go on, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Minister um, your word to us and each and every one of us. And help us to understand just what this struggle is, but more importantly, how we can have victory over the old nature on a daily basis. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for this and give you all the glory and honor. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Now, like I said, this is part seven <clears throat> of our series in Christ, and the subtitle of today's message is The Conflict of the Spirit with the Flesh. Now, you don't have to have been a born-again believer, and that's the only kind there is, by the way. You know, we sometimes make it sound like there's this sect, sect that's born-again Christians than every other Christian. No, if you haven't been born again, I got news for you. You're not a Christian. You may be a Christian, a cultural Christian, you may be a Christian in name, but you are not a disciple and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That takes the new birth experience. Read John, <clears throat> the Gospel of John in particular, where Nicodemus comes and asks that very question. And Jesus is explicit in his answer to Nicodemus. Notice as <clears throat> we get in today's message, the manner in which the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer is to energize the great truths of Calvary in, that, in their heart and life, thereby bringing them to their full potential, this 
Great victory purchased by Christ. Now I want to say something. You must understand the moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. He is there. He's taken up residence in your body. He is living there. But all that He wants to do is potential only. Because unlike other spirits, demonic spirits, Satan, He drives the person to conform to what He wants or pushes. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate that. He will not take any control of any part of your life unless you give it to Him. That's the difference. Because He will not usurp, override, nullify your free will. So let's move on and keep that in mind as we go through today's message. However, if the believer does not know this, this great truth of who we are in Christ, there, then it, <coughs> there is then very little the Holy Spirit can do. Look at John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, we all know this, and the truth shall make you free. What's the truth? Truth is Jesus Christ completed, finished all you have need of, not only to save you, Today, yesterday when you got saved, saved today if this is when the hour has come for that decision or you're saved in the future. What he was talking about here is the truth of what Christ did on Calvary. That is the truth that everything hinges on in the world and the universe for all time. Because had Christ not gone to Calvary, had he not redeemed man, then even the universe itself would still be decaying, would eventually implode on itself. Everything hangs on that truth. That truth, Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. It's the simplistic simplicity of the gospel. And then he says, and the truth, the fact that he died for you and gave his life up, but rose again in victory, not his victory for himself, so to speak, but our victory because he won it for us, that makes you free, amen? amen. And the problem is most people, Christians, who are saved and born again, understand that it's Christ and Christ alone that saves them. And I'll be a broken record from here until the Lord calls us out of here. But we must understand that same faith that birthed you into the kingdom through your faith and what Christ did for you. That same faith has to remain there for your victory and your sanctification, which means being set aside for the glory of God. In other words, it's not what you do for God that cleans you up and makes you useful. It's what Jesus Christ has already done for you. You just have to receive that. Amen? Amen. Now we've got to move on and we'll be here too long because I've not even got to the message yet. So now let us see and learn the dynamics of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, please. Go back to the scriptures if you can. It's all right if you don't want to, or you can't. I might have thrown a curveball at them. Um, but let's look at verse 5 if you got your Bibles. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. This certainly can refer to the unsaved, but also to Christians. And I'll tell you, you can prove it easy because as a believer, have you ever done something, you prayed against it, you you read your Bible, you went to church, you said, I'm never going to do this thing again, and you found yourself doing it again. Has anybody been there? Maybe I have a real bad attitude. i got an anger problem. I think I have whipped that monster because I've been good at, at going to church. I've been reading my Bible every day. I've got a communion with the Father. I'm praying every day. And something goes along, or you go along real good for a while, and something trips it up, and there that ugly monster has raised its head once again. Well, you know what that is? You were trying to defeat that monster, and by what you did, not accepting what Christ has already done. I know that sounds simple, but that's the gospel. It's that simple. We just have to learn to rest in His finished work. Now let's look at this. So you see, however, the thrust of Paul's teaching is to the believer. Now the Greek render, renders it this way. For those who are habitually dominated by the flesh put their mind on the things of the flesh. So when you look at flesh as it is used here, it pertains to the sin nature. In other words, the Christian is dominated by the sin nature in some facet of his life when he constantly is moving along falling, asking forgiveness, God who is always just and, and willing and always does forgive, and then you move along and you fall again into that same trap, that's because you do not understand that you're trying to defeat the flesh 
through efforts of the flesh. And the devil's been so good at disguising that because to the believer, you want to do things for God or you think, um, and, you, and you need to, you need to read the scriptures on a daily basis. That's what feeds your spirit. You need to gather with like-minded believers in, around the word of God and the preaching of God's word. You need to do that. That's, that's where we strengthen one another. And the body is, is being ministered to by the preaching of the word of God. And you uh, fast or you do these other great uh, uh, Christian disciplines that are needful and necessary. But the problem comes in when we somehow believe that because we do these things, that's where our victory lies. And it's not it at all because we take good things and then suddenly have made a work out of it. Your victory lies in what Christ has already done. Grab onto that. Don't let go. And when those impulses or the Satan comes to bring something against your way to trip you up, say, listen, I can't defeat you in myself. I've learned that now. But guess what? You've already been defeated by my elder brother, Jesus Christ, on that cross on a hill called Calvary 2,000 years ago. You may just have to be that blunt about it. And you will find then that the Holy Spirit says, good, you're out of the way, I'm going to step in here. And when he steps in and takes control, those besetting sins start to fall off and the enemy of your soul has to retreat because he cannot stand in the almighty presence of God. Amen? Amen? He just can't do it. See, dominating the Greek means down. So the manner in which it is used refers to the state being continuous. In other words, the enemy will continually drag you down because you have not understood where your victory lies. Not in your good disciplines and living for God, which that's pleasing to God when you live for Him, but that doesn't bring victory. What brings victory is your faith remaining anchored in what Christ has done and completed at Calvary. Remember, the flesh can never deliver from the flesh. Mind, as used here, means to exercise the mind or have a sentiment or opinion. In other words, the believer who is dominated by the sin nature, the flesh here, has an improper understanding of the Word of God concerning this problem and is attempting to gain victory in the wrong way. And I'll tell you, for the first 15, 16 years of my life, I did not understand this at all. But about 20 years ago, the Holy Spirit took me to two scriptures. The first being, it is finished. And I understood that, but I did not understand up until that moment when, the, when it started to be revealed to me what he meant by it is finished. He meant that if I crushed the devil's head and said it is finished, then everything you have need of, I provided for. And I said, yes, Lord, I, don't, I know you did. But see, it wasn't a reality yet. It was, it, the light, so to speak, hadn't gone off yet. But immediately on the hills of that came the scripture, he who has begun a good work in you will see it through the... So he will see it through to the end of the great day of the Lord. In other words, and then I started understanding that the victory, that what Jesus started in my life in 1983 of February of that year, he has up to that moment, 20 years ago, and even up to now, has continued to work in my life as I've yielded my life to him and kept my faith now anchored in the finished work of Christ. And it's something that I don't have a complete grasp of. So if I sound rhetorical to you, it's because I got to be that way to myself. I got to remind myself on a daily basis that I am in Christ. Christ is in me. The old man's been put in the tomb. And sometimes I have to almost visualize in my head looking at the old nature saying, Old man, you're not going to trip me up. You're dead. And if you're dead, I don't have to listen to you. Glory be to the Lamb of God. I've been delivered from you. From the power that you once yielded in my life because of the sin. The, the, the sin nature, and that's what you are, you're dead. But thank God I've been raised in Christ. I remind him of that. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm not subject to the old ways. I'm not subject to the old passions. In fact, some of those passions uh, are still there, but they've now been, been sanctified and made and, and put in their proper perspective. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm not mean, so if you think I'm mean, you don't understand. It's just you haven't heard preaching with passion coming from the heart of the preacher. Yeah. Amen. My dear God, when you think how great God is, how can you sit there and not be a little passionate about it? He sets over everything. He spoke everything into existence just by His Word. Everything is sustained by His Word. If God were to withdraw Himself for one second, the entire universe would collapse in on itself. And we would just be scattered in the billions of atoms. 
How can you not be excited by someone who loves you so much that he became a man to die for you? That's powerful, isn't it? I know what it's like to be in those times of trouble just like you do. I can remember when I thought my whole world was coming to an end. Sitting there at the living room at 2 o'clock in the morning as a young man in my mid-twenties. Looked like everything was dissolving. And as I sat there with the tears rolling down, it's literally as though Jesus showed up and said, will you two forsake me? And it was as clear as if you asked me that. That's, it wasn't an audible voice, but it, you know sometimes the Lord can speak so much louder in your spirit that it's even louder than an audible voice. And all I could do was say, well, Jesus, where would I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And what I meant by that too, you're the only one that can handle this situation. I can't. And at that moment, I felt as though arms had come around me. And I knew, didn't know how, I was still broken, but I knew I could trust Him and it was going to be all right. I'm here to tell you today, you can trust Jesus. You can't trust sometimes a spouse. You can't trust sometimes best friends. We know Julius Caesar couldn't. One of his best friends stabbed him in the back. How many times have all of us said that? Quoting Shakespeare, you too, Brutus? <laughs> but thank God we don't serve one that is fickle. We serve one that is the sure rock of which everything is built upon that glorifies God. Amen? You see, this is the opposite of those who are after the flesh, the sin nature. But that which is after the Spirit is that which is according to the Word of God. So what are the two things, or what are the things of the Spirit? Things in the Greek is logos and means something said, including the thought, by implication, a topic, also reasoning or motive, and above all, the divine expression, which is Jesus Christ in you. So who Jesus is, what Jesus said, and what Jesus did is the eternal logos, in other words, the things of the Spirit. And you want to know what God's like? Get in His Bible, get in His Word, get in the book. And you'll learn what Jesus is like. You'll learn, learn what the Father's like. You'll learn how the Holy Spirit is there to comfort and guide you. In verse 6 then, so says the first part, For to be carnally minded is death. And I'm going to pick up the pace so we won't be here till 2 o'clock. I'll say this, when I first started preaching, man, I thought, how am I ever going to fill 40 minutes? That long ago has left us. How can I get it in 40, 45 minutes? Or even an hour? Be carnally minded is in the Greek means the mind of the flesh, in other words, the sin nature. It means that the mind is po uh, possessed by, then controlled or dominated by the evil nature. The description of an unsafe person or a believer who is led, not led, excuse me, by the Spirit of God. In the unbeliever, it would be dominated. He can't be led by the Spirit of God because he's an unbeliever. But to the child of God who's struggling and the sin nature is ascending, it's because they're not being led by the Spirit. They've gone back to being led by that old nature. So the word death speaks of spiritual death. In other words, in other words separation from God. So the question must be asked, can the believer continue, continue indefinitely following after the flesh? The Bible, I think, is clear or not, emphatically, no. But yet, there's no line drawn in the sand respecting that far and no further. In other words, I'm not one, neither can any other man say you've crossed the line. In fact, the line I would draw, saying you've crossed this, you're hopeless, God's given up on you, would be so far short from where God would draw the line, I can tell you that much. See, men are more likely to give up on men, and that's not God's way. In fact, if you want to see the heart of God, God is still calling people right to their last breath to give their hearts to Him. I'm not saying some people haven't hit that line. I think I've met one or two in 30 years of being a Christian and 20, almost 25 years now being in the ministry. I think I have met some one or two that I think were true reprobates. 
They just didn't not want, want, not want anything to do God with God. They were actually God haters. That's for another time, though. God will always forgive if the person is truly sincere. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Many of you know this by heart. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as some teach in the Word of Faith movement, they say that He's referring to unbelievers. But no, that book was written to the believer. Because if you finish reading 1 John, it also says, He who says they're without sin, they're a liar. Meaning the sin nature. That's talking about to the believer. As well as the unbeliever. But it's referring to those because back in John's day, there were those saying that once you were saved, there was never any temptation to sin. You never sinned again. In fact, they were teaching a sinless perfection. And John sat there and, and tells them, and I think it's a verse 10 or 11, that those who say they're without sin, they are a liar. The truth of God is not in them. In other words, the sin nature is still in the heart or in the life of the believer, but he needs to be in the tomb when he's kept in the tomb. And we do that by reckoning Paul says in the 6th chapter, as being dead, then the old nature will not reign in us. Because from time to time you're going to mess up. And as we get older, I know uh, it's less and less sins of commission, more and more sins of omission. Here's be an example. God tells Alan to go over and give Pastor Jeff $500. And he doesn't do it. Would that be a sin of omission? I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm being facetious here. I'm trying to make it point out a fact. We are, at times, the Holy Spirit tells us to do something and we don't do it, do we? For whatever reason. And lots of times we think, oh, that's just me. How many times has anybody ever said that? Oh, maybe that's just me thinking it. And then to come to find out I had some of it where it said, where it was real to me, no, because of circumstances that unfolded that, no, I should have I done that. I missed God on that. I'll give you a, a real life example. Back in 1995, <clears throat> I drove for Allied Van Lines. I drove for them for years. And um, I was up at Resaca, Georgia at the Flying J, J truck stop, and I was filling up back then. Gas or diesel fuel was still like 98 or 99 cents a gallon. So I always, always make sure when I left Georgia, I was tanks full. And I was towards the end of the fuel island. There's like 20 fuel pumps, and they're all full of people. And I'm at almost the very end, and as I'm filling my tank up, I notice a guy sitting over there on the outside uh, where the drivers would walk in to pay for fuel. And uh, he didn't look like the normal person that's hitchhiking because he was very well dressed, had a polo shirt on, clean, clean shaven. Um, you could just tell he didn't fit the typical, I'm trying to catch a ride with a truck driver to get to where I want to go. So I go in, I pay for my fuel. And as I'm walking out, I said hey, hello to him or something. And I go get in the truck. And as I'm hitting my brake release not valves to release the truck brakes and the trailer brakes, I hear this. And I'm in a cab over at the time. And I look down, and there's a guy standing there. And it's this guy. And he says this. I'm traveling to so-and-so. I'm laying over here for a couple days. And I just wondered if you're loading or unloading the area so I could work and get some money. And I wasn't. I was heading for, I think it was San Francisco. I just finished loading in Atlanta. And I said, no, I don't have anything. So he goes, thanks, I appreciate it. And as he's walking by, and there again, I start to hit my knobs of the valve. It, there again, it was so loud, it says, go give that man 100 bucks." And it's not because I didn't have hardly any money. I had like 1500 in cash on me. As a mover, you always had to have cash because that's how you pay your, lump, your lumpers to help load and unload. Well, anyways... I sat there and argued in my mind, said, oh, that's just me. And, but here was the crux of the matter. By the time the 90s came along, much of the graffiti, and of course that was an ever, ever, never-ending um, uh, problem in truck stops or where they always have to keep repainting walls and fixing this and that. But a lot of it was now becoming homosexual in nature, believe it or not. And as I sat there and was going to give them this little other voice came to my head and said, now if you go and give him $100 in front of all these other drivers that are, it's going to look like you're propositioning him. And I thought, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to do that. It wasn't the issue of the money. 
But I tell you what, when I turned back on I-75 going north, it's like the Lord took me to the woodshed. And I, th I, I, I believe from that moment on, and even unto this day, I can't help but wonder, did I just entertain an angel unawares? See, it wasn't about the money. The money wasn't the thing. It was about pride in my life. Am I willing to stoop down and help someone? Regardless, what if that was the case? It doesn't matter. If, he, if the Holy Spirit said, give that man a hundred bucks, did that go against the Word of God? No. But you know what it went against? The carnal mind. That's what it went against. So I know what that means to be led and to listen to the carnal mind. But thank God I don't listen to that old man. In fact, as the older I get, the more I despise that old nature. And I think that's true with everyone that's wanting to go on with God. And I'll, I'll move on here. I'm going to try and be done by 22. I think I can hit it. Amen? But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is what produces the most fulfilling life that one could ever know. See, the word spiritually minded in the Greek means the mind possessed by the Spirit, thus controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the word peace, as used here, means to bind together that which has been separated. Thus, the believing sinner is bound together with God and his life after having been separated by sin. In other words, Christ binds the old man or the old sinner He's put in the grave, but we're raised in a new creation. So the old man now has been transformed by the power and spirit of God in his life, and he's now bound to the Father. There's a relationship there. That's why Paul would go on to say, don't you know that we can now enter boldly into the throne room of grace and we can go right up to the Father and say, Father, I have a need. No longer do we have to go through a, media, uh, a mediator, uh, an earthly, a man, like a priest or the high priest of the old covenant. No, we got a mediator that sits at the right hand of the Father that's already made, uh, uh, has already uh, stepped into that role as the high, our high priest, has already made our case before God. So Paul says you can go boldly into the throne of grace. You can walk right up there because Christ has already, as your advocate, he has, he has laid out the case how, uh, to the Father that you're his, he's in you, you're in him, and he can say, Father, here's is one of ours that has a problem, and the Father says, I want to do what needs to be done in your life, my dear child. And that's exactly the attitude. As a believer, you must understand and have that God is always for you, not against you. Amen? Amen. He's not even against the sinner, per se. He's against sin, but he's made a way because he wants to always be reconciled to those that are away from him and lost so he can bring them in as dear children. As John would say, the Apostle John. You see, it is a free gift from God, and it, can, and it comes simply by faith in what God has said and done. So you see, this life and peace spoken here cannot be purchased by money or attained by education, discovered by scientific theory, or earned by religious works. It's simply that, a free gift. In verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God means that anything that is not led of the Spirit and used in the manner in which God intended is of the flesh and is at enmity with God. In other words, your motives can be right. But if you're not being led by the Spirit, and how's that play out in reality? We in churches, uh, pastors and um, those that are workers in the church, we have a tendency to map out a program and yet we've never take, uh, uh, take it to the, the issue before God and say, God, do you want me to do this program? No, we do the program. We set it all up. That's by the carnal mind, even if it's got right motives. And then we turn around and say, God, now you bless this, that what I came up with. And it may be something that God doesn't want you as the pastor, you as a congregate, you, we as a church to even do. What works and what God's doing in the church down the street doesn't, and doesn't mean can be uh, carbon copied and made over here. We have to have our own purpose, not because... I don't want to do what they want to do simply because we're in the body of Christ. God doesn't have 10,000 heads. He doesn't have 10,000 feet. Wouldn't that look funny? No neck or torso, just heads on feet. <laughs> Be kind of freaky look good, wouldn't it? So Paul's explaining two things. The first one, worldliness, 
And he's warning all believers of the danger of all things which are not totally of the Lord. This speaks of the Christian's consecration and dedication. It speaks of their sincerity before God and one's relationship with Christ. In other words, every facet of our being is of the Lord, needs to be of the Lord. Secondly, the Word of God, which is the remedy for the carnal mind. That's, the, that's why Paul said, renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? Well, you don't renew it by reading man's wisdom. That's renewing it in the wrong way. That's reviving the old nature. But when you renew it by the reading of God's Word, and then when the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, then say, you know what, you're right. I missed it here, but I'm going on with you, God. That's how you renew your mind. And when we have the mind of Christ, the old man, he's going to lay there in the tomb and just molter and rot, which he needs to, amen? I've said this a hundred times if I've said it once from this pulpit right here. Your greatest enemy is Satan, but his greatest ally is that old man that looks at you in the mirror. That old nature that is constantly trying to crawl out of the grave. See, the word enmity, enmity means hostility, and as used here, against God. So, excuse me, it's being hostile towards God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither can be. Subject in the Greek is a military term, meaning to arrange in order under. So in other words, God has a divine order, and all believers are to come under that order. Amen? And listen, every one of us at times have been out of the will of God, and it has never produced good things. Has it? No, it just doesn't. In fact, I was hard-headed. It took me a long time to learn that my biggest problem is me. You know, I wasn't out there trying to do things I shouldn't be doing. There was occasion I've done that, so rest, rest assured there, in case you think I was super pious. But my point is this, when something would go on, I'd immediately set about to try to fix it. And I like what Shannon said, he didn't fix it, he broke it. That's, that was me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, I didn't even get close to putting a Band-Aid on it. By the time it was done, it needed to be in a, in a burning ward because I burned it down. So the carnal mind is not a spiritual mind, and the reason being is that, is that it's not a humble mind. And the law of God is literally the Word of God. That is the main reason Christians struggle in their faith and are led astray is because they don't get in the Word of God. That's what the law of God here is, is pointing to and means it's the Word of God. If we are in this, guess what? Then the Holy Spirit can talk to us. If you don't get in this, you just, 99% of what He wants to tell you comes right through here. And if He tells you something, it will never deviate from the spirit of this book. You can just put that off to the side there because that's good to understand and keep in mind. Verse 8, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. So we are told that faith pleases God while flesh displeases God. So everything that God has, does, and uses in regards to the human family originates totally, absolutely, completely, and all together with Him. Salvation, as we know, is all of God and not of man. So the only way anything can be attain, obtained from the Lord is through the vehicle of faith. So this means we believe what God has said and receive it at face value. In addition, true faith in God also consecrates itself to the will of God in everything. In other words, your will, when you got the mind of Christ and you're not operating in the flesh, will always say something along this, what lines? God, I want my will to be swallowed up in your will. And two things happen when we pray and sincerely seek God in that way. Sometimes our will does line up with God's will in the life, but maybe it's not the right timing. But many times our will is the exact opposite of what God wants in our life. And what God wants is always perfect to the, to the glorification and edifying, first to the glorification of Christ in us and the edifying is of, of us in Christ. But if I get in my will... None of that happens. It just becomes a big mess. So all that the believer can do respecting the will of God is to furnish a willing mind and obedient heart. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12 says, For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. In other words, God only expects and only, only wants you to have a mind that's willing to follow Him. A will that will be subservient to His will. I kind of like the idea of it being swallowed up by His will. Because that places me in the center of His love. And nothing but good things can happen because of that. Notice God does not look for ability, talent, resources, or self-will in a man as a requirement. But rather the very opposite, which is a brokenness before Him, a humble spirit. If self-righteousness becomes the attitude, though, of the believer, the flesh from such a source is just as hateful. Now this will go against a lot of religious people. It's just as hateful to God as it is in an unbeliever, but even worse. There's nothing more repugnant of all the sins I believe that man can commit than that of being self-righteous. And you may think, boy, that's a pretty sharp statement, Pastor. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, let me tell you somebody who did agree with that, or more importantly, I agree with him. And that is, Jesus said, it's easier for the harlot and the drunkard and all these people that you've cast out as dogs to enter into the kingdom of God than you. And he was looking right at the evangelical conservatives of his day. He pointed right at to the Pharisees. Because see, a self-righteous individual, they don't see their brokenness before God. They don't see anything that they have need of God of. In fact, they feel that God has been very pleased because he's helped them. He's helped, or excuse me, they've helped God out. They're doing something that only they can do for God. I must confess, those are the people that drive me the most to want to just punch them right in the head. You ever feel like that? It's self-righteousness. But see, that's wrong at it because Jesus still loves them. See, I'd want to just, I'd want to set them right at the precipice of the lake of fire on banana peels. See, that would be my attitude, which would be a wrong attitude, wouldn't it? If I've ever had problems in any of the places I've ever been, it's been from those people 99.9% .9 of the time. Enough said on that. So all that the believer can do respecting the will of God, like I said, is to furnish a willing mind. See, as the flesh, which this is this in nature, keeps most of humanity from coming to God, likewise the flesh in the, is the greatest hindrance to the believer the one who is in Christ. But ye are not in the flesh. There again, Paul's reminding us in here in verse, I believe it's 9 or 10. But the Holy Spirit is reminding the Christian, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So why are you depending on the flesh, your own strength? He's asking that. What do you, you know better than that. But in the Spirit, in other words, you must have the Holy Spirit to help you. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. In essence says, assuming that, provided that. In other words, he's saying, listen, you know the Holy Spirit's in you. Dwell then in the Greek here means to live or dwell in a certain place as your home. You see, the Holy Spirit is actively at home in the believer. He has taken up residence. Boy, when I put that down on paper yesterday, I really thought of this. If I truly think like that, boy, how will that dictate how I live? Sobering thought, isn't it? What I do, what I see, what I hear, what I say, where I go. That's why Paul says we do frustrate the grace of God. It's not even so much the acts of sin, and I'm not saying and making light of those acts whatsoever. Sin is sin, and sin is deadly. But what really frustrates the Holy Spirit is those who are truly, honestly trying to overcome whatever it is that's hindering their lives, but they're trying to do it in their own strength. That's where the frustration of grace because he will not operate, he being the Holy Spirit, outside the legal confines of Calvary. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
is referring to the Holy Spirit, it is not possible then for a person to be truly saved without the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, is talking about a person having accepted Jesus as their own personal Savior. And there again, this is, he's talking to brethren here. Upon conversion, the divine nature, which is the divi uh, nature of God, is instantly placed in the heart of the believer as well. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within the child of God. See, the body is dead because of sin, speaks of the human body. But the spirit of life, because of righteousness, tells us several things. The Spirit, speaking of the Holy Spirit here, who is God and can do anything, in other words, He's Almighty. We forget about that. So there's not anything out there that can bound, bind the Christian, keep them bound, any habit, any thought, pattern, anything that the Holy Spirit, by operating through what Christ has already done, can break every fetter, every chain, can crush every uh, enemy that comes against you, can remove every mountain that the enemy has placed in front of you. Because He is Almighty. You see, the Spirit of life, he has, he has life and is the source of life. And righteousness, the righteousness then addressed here is the righteousness of God which is given to any sinner upon faith in Christ and given instantly. The moment you were saved in positionally in the mind of God because you're in Christ, you're as sanctified, as perfect, as righteous, as holy as you will ever be. Now you say, Pastor, that's crazy because I still got problems. In my yes, but positionally in the mind of God because there again, where is our identity placed? Our identity is where? In Christ. He took your sin, he, broke, he paid the penalty of sin, and He broke the power of sin in your life. That's the sin nature. And so standing in front of God, you are positionally righteous as you will ever be. Now the work then of the Holy Spirit now is to bring my everyday walk over here where it will finally measure and mirror that which is true about me in my position. Now this is an ongoing progress and this over here will never match this over here until the resurrection. But thank God, remember what I, He told me 25 years ago? He who's begun that good work in you will what? Until the great day of judgment. Meaning, we're preserved. The only one that can thwart that plan is me. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, verse 11, the same power of the Holy Spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwells in the believer and is available for our use. So he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you. Paul is not speaking exclusively of the, <clears throat> of the coming resurrection by the use of the word mortal. He is speaking of our present situation. Because when you get the glorified body at the rapture, the resurrection, none of this matters anymore. You've ascended far above it. In fact, the sin nature, the old nature is forever gone out of your life. You don't even have to go by there. He's not even in there rotting into a pile of dust anymore. He's completely eradicated. Isn't that going to be a great time? So Paul here, though, is speaking about this mortal body. That means he's available to help me the here and now. Quicken in the Greek means to cause, to live, make alive, give life. And he's talking about to this mortal body. Amen? We have a right to, to uh, stand on by his stripes we are healed. We have a right to stand on that I don't know how, but he's going to provide for me. Because I follow him, uh, he loves me, I'm in him, and I'm his child. And just like your child, you wouldn't say when they were five years old, six years old, uh, a two-year-old, you'd say, okay, go out and make your way. No, because they're depending on you. Now, if our Father in Heaven is perfect, well, when we're none of us are, and we can depend on our earthly Father, how much more can we depend on our Heavenly Father? Amen? Therefore, brethren, in verse 12, Paul's addressing believers and not unbelievers. Believers become carnally minded who do not properly understand what it means to be in Christ or are purposely going back to the ways of the world. There are some that do that. Where it says we are debtors refers to that which we owe Jesus Christ. Debtors in the Greek means on, on <coughs> one held 
by an obligation. And so not to the flesh. In other words, I'm not obligated to serve you old nature. That means we don't owe anything to the flesh. And here specifically, he's referring to religious flesh. In other words, those who would attempt to, uh, to for, um, force the believer to adhere to man-devised religious laws. So the idea is that, the, that as a believer, I do not owe anything to another Christian except to love him as Christ loves him. That's all you owe me. That's all I owe you. I don't, I'm not set up here to, to give you a set of rules and make sure you abide by them. That's not what a pastor does. In fact, there's only one head, Jesus Christ. Now, there is the five-fold ministry. Being a pastor is one of them. Yes, you're to learn from when I teach. Yes, you should hear the words I preach. But at the same time, you're taking it to the Word of God. And if I deviate from the Word of God, it's not because I got some fresh revelation and God's going to do some, some new thing, which we heard a lot 20 years ago, 30 years ago. No, it's because I'm getting away from God's Word. If you ever noticed, and I'll quickly move on, Paul never forced anything on the churches. He implored them greatly to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's all that is, that is mine to do. So to live after the flesh, the sin nature. As a child of God, I must order my life after the Holy Spirit who will always guide me according to truth. In other words, the Word of God. So as a believer, I owe the flesh nothing. Now stand with me and I'll bring it to a close. I'm about four minutes past when I should have been. I've, I've gone long today, but <clears throat> I'm trying to get through this series by the end of August, and I'm going to be gone one Sunday. Verse 13, look at that. For if ye live after the flesh, flesh ye shall die. So the thrust of the matter is this. A person who lives habitually under the dominion of the evil nature, and Paul is referring here to believers, that person will ultimately lose their soul. Again, no, Paul is speaking to believers, not unbelievers. Whenever the word die is used in, the, in this fashion, as in this scripture 13, it actually refers to the final death in the lake of fire, and the warning is twofold. This is speaking primarily to the believer, again, notice Paul addressing brethren in verse 12, who does not avail himself of what Christ did at Calvary and continues to live habitually under the dominion of sin. While God is always long-suffering and compassionate and will forgive any time and every time the person is truly sincere, as in 1 John 1, 9. Still, the danger is that the individual will begin, and this is what happens, I've seen it play out, to make allowances for their sin, they quit seeking forgiveness and lose their way totally and completely. It also speaks of the believers playing loose with the world. In other words, living after the flesh will become part of the world. And the world system is antagonistic, as you know, to the child of God. In reality, it is hostile to the believer's faith. Now I want to add something on that real quick because I'm about to bring it to a close. I believe the Holy Spirit did reveal something to me. It's been about a year ago now. Because that always bothered me. How can people who claim to be saved live a life that's no different than those that claim no such experience? And I think he showed me the answers because and going back to where Paul said, they preach another Jesus. And here's the key, that's anointed by another spirit that's delivered by another gospel. And see, that, and also that's where people who just give up on trying to overcome when they, and, and the reason they're giving up is because they've tried to overcome where Christ has already overcame that, came that whatever they need of for them. But what happens when you persist in sin, then pretty soon you start moving your faith to that Jesus that aligns up and, and says it's okay, I accept you in your strength your struggle. It's okay. You, I accept you whether you're struggling that or not. I accept you whether you ever lay it down or not. And that's anointed by another spirit. We may actually feel that's right. It may go good for us. All, ever so slowly you're being moved from the simplicity of the gospel to another Jesus. That Jesus, I'm here to tell you, does not demand that you follow him. 
the Jesus of the Bible said, if you're going to be my disciple, you'll what? Obey my camp commandments and follow me. This other Jesus says, nah, I'll just stick by you. Whatever. You just keep going. You're okay as long as you believe in me. Now that may sound like you're splitting hairs, but that's a vast distinction between those two Jesus. You see, this one loves you enough to confront you and to convict you and to bring you out of sin. This one says, that's okay, let's just party together and after all, it all turns out good in the end. I don't want to serve that one. That's the reason Paul did say, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. In 2 Corinthians 6, 17. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live, tells us several things. Again, Paul speaking here of believers. We are told that it is only through the Spirit of God that we can overcome the sin nature. And thirdly, we are not to accommodate the sin nature. We are to mortify it and its deeds through the body. Mortifying the Greek means to kill, to put to death. Now, not to kill your body, so don't run out and commit hairy carry, but the sin nature. This is what Paul says is not a suggestion, but really, it's an ultimatum. For if the Holy Spirit is given permission, He will do great things within our lives. That old sin nature, he's that, what was it, uh, well you can see how, how deep I am. I'm thinking of Elmer Fudd when he was going through on the Looney Tunes, said, where's that waskwee wabbit? <laughs> and the old sin nature's kind of that rascally rabbit, isn't he? He just wants to pop up out of that hole. And I'll tell you what, if you try to defeat, defeat him in your own self-effort, you know what happens, anybody ever played those carnival games? Yeah. Pops up here and you hit it, and the, and the faster you go, the more they just keep coming up and, until you're overwhelmed. Isn't that the way it is? But listen, you are more than conquerors through Him that loved you. And you're going to make it. And I'm going to make it. Amen? Now the altar's always open. And I want to start doing something today, and we'll quickly do this, but let's pray for those of us that are sick. Let's just lift ourselves up. I got healing needs to be done in my body. Some of you do the same. So, um, why don't we just all come down here and let's pray for one another. And we won't have to be here long, but um, it's not the amount of prayer we do. It's what we believe in and whom, more importantly, we believe in when we do pray. Amen? Amen. Who wants to be the first? Hi. All right.
every Sunday. Because James says, yeah. if there be any sick among you, yeah. um, even it, sick, yes, die. even in this small church, is there ever time when none of us have never got something wrong? Oh. Uh, really? All right, see, there we go. Yes, Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for James' healing of his shoulder because, Jesus, those stripes you took was for even shoulders that are injured. And right now, strengthen the muscles around that, strengthen that, uh, I forget what it's called, the rotator cuff. Right now, you strengthen it that it will not pop out anymore. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do what? No, bring them on up. I think that's a good thing. Because our schools are hotbeds of witchcraft anymore and everything else. What's that? No. And you know what? Get, get Molly and Marianne. We need to cover them too. Well, Marianne, but we'll cover her. But let's cover Molly and, and Marianne through this with them. Because you know what? Schools are not for your kids. They're not here to uh, to strengthen you and raise your kids. They're here to re-educate them. And I said re-educate. And also pray for our brethren in China. They say it's worse. It's worse it's been in a hundred years. They're really going after the churches now. They're throwing them in labor camps and everything. Our brothers and sisters in China are suffering tremendously. I, I prayed, Lord, you know what? Come and get us. Let's get out of this sin sick world. I'm tired of it. It's no good. It's, it's doing nothing but going down. In fact, uh, I was talking to L.A. about a year ago, and we talked from time to time, and he said, you know, Jeff, there's no way out but up anymore. We're not going to turn this, this thing around. This is the tight.